if you have a high blood pressure, you are not alone. High blood pressure is more common in men during middle age. Children can also become hypertensive for many of the same reasons or causes as adults, such as inactivity, unhealthy diet and obesity. Lifestyle changes can really help to lower the blood pressure. High blood pressure is usually a symptomless and silent killer if left uncontrolled. So today's lecture consists of discussion on hypertension. We'll see what is blood pressure and what are the different categories of hypertension, signs and symptoms of hypertension, etiology and pathophysiology, complications and pharmacotherapy. What is blood pressure? A blood pressure is the measure of pressure of circulating blood on the vessel walls. It is usually expressed in terms of systolic pressure over diastolic pressure. Now, systolic pressure is the higher number, that is 120, and it is higher because it represents the pressure when the heart contracts and the blood flows out of the heart. Diastolic pressure is the phase in the cardiac cycle when the heart relaxes and the blood flows in. Now, both atria and ventricles undergo systole and diastole, and it is essential that these two components or phases are carefully regulated and coordinated to ensure the blood pressure is pumped efficiently to the body. I assume that since we are going to discuss hypertension in this lecture, you are already familiar with the most basic physiological concepts, importantly the cardiac cycle events. So let's jump straight in. What is hypertension? A hypertension is a condition in which the arterial blood pressure is chronically elevated. By chronic elevation, I mean when it is elevated for a long time. Now, in general, the arterial pressure refers to the pressure measured within the large arteries in the systemic circulation. Now, as you know that the blood pressure numbers split into systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, or systole over diastole, so if the blood pressure of a person remains persistently elevated than these numbers, then he or she may be called a hypertensive. The hypertension basically is deviation from these normal numbers to abnormally high numbers. Uh, it generally represents a quantitative rather than a qualitative deviation from the normal numbers. These are quantities. So it's a deviation of the quantities to abnormally high numbers. We shall discuss these high numbers in the coming slides. The blood pressure is measured in the units of millimeter of mercury or mm of Hg and the readings are always relevant when they are given in pairs of systole and diastole in millimeter of mercury. If the blood pressure of a person is 120 over 80 or less than that, he or she would be called as normotensive. So let's categorize the hypertensives on the basis of uh, their numbers as outlined by JNC or Joint National Committee guidelines, according to which uh, the blood pressure numbers of less than 120 over 80 are considered optimal or the best or the most favorable. The numbers are still considered normal even if they are in the range of 120 to 129 for systolic and 80 to 84 for diastolic. They both are called prehypertensives. The WHO also calls this group as prehypertensives when their readings are between normal and borderline. The borderline hypertension is often called high normal. So this is normal. The borderline is also called high normal. 
uh, a high normal blood pressure and it shows that you are in the gray zone or you fall anywhere between normal and abnormal values and lifestyle and dietary changes are often recommended to bring down these high numbers the person is said to be hypertensive if the blood pressure is equal to a higher than 140 over 90 millimeter of mercury and that remains consistently high in this zone which means he or she is an established case of hypertension the hypertension category is subdivided into three stages stage one hypertension is when the blood pressure consistently ranges from 140 to 159 and 90 to 99 at this stage the patient is likely to receive an antihypertensive medication along with mandatory lifestyle changes stage 2 is when the blood pressure consistently ranges at 160 to 179 and 100 to 109 at this stage the patient usually requires more than one antihypertensive drug with different mechanism of action to provide better control of the numbers stage 3 represents an extreme elevation in blood pressure equal to and above 180 by 110 and this stage needs mandatory medical attention because it could lead to serious cardiovascular accidents such as heart attack or stroke and we usually call this condition as hypertensive crisis over time the damage caused by persistently high blood pressure if left untreated could lead to heart attack or myocardial infarction or MI and also the stroke or brain infarction or cerebral infarction signs and symptoms of hypertension high blood pressure or hypertension is often regarded as symptomless silent killer so if you ignore it because you think certain signs will alert you to the problem you are taking a dangerous chance with your life there are some signs and symptoms however which are present sometimes such as facial flushing dizziness headaches fatigue blood vision uh, in more severe cases it may cause headache and epistaxis which is the nosebleed and this could happen in case of hypertensive crisis when the blood pressure shoots to 180 over 120 mm of mercury etiologies or causes of hypertension but there are two main causes or etiologies of uh, hypertension one is primary or essential hypertension and other is secondary hypertension now primary hypertension accounts for 95 percent cases of all hypertension and essential hypertension is heterogeneous a heterogeneous means it could have different causes in different patients and we shall discuss these causes in coming slides a secondary hypertension is the high blood pressure which is caused by some other medical condition or a disease or a pathology let's have a look at the etiologies of essential hypertension they include obesity insulin resistance high salt to sodium intake low potassium low calcium aging high alcohol intake and sedentary lifestyle pathophysiology of essential hypertension now each factor or cause discussed on the previous slide has some pathophysiological link in causing essential hypertension let's check out one by one how these factors are linked to hypertension starting with obesity a hypertension is linked to obesity in many ways uh, obesity may lead to hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases by activating the well-known renin angiotensin aldosterone system or ras and most of you know that this is a system which is responsible for the regulation of blood pressure now obesity also promotes the 
endothelial dysfunction and insulin resistance. We shall discuss these two factors later in this lecture. The research shows that obesity increases the renin secretion from the kidney. Now what is renin? Now renin is an enzyme released by the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney. Renin is also called angiotensinogenase because it acts on a protein called angiotensinogen which is released by the liver into the blood and this renin then converts this angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Now basically this renin cleaves this angiotensinogen or causes breakdown of this angiotensinogen into a decapeptide called angiotensin 1. So this angiotensin 1 is a decapeptide. It means it contains 10 amino acid residues. Angiotensin 1 is known to be biologically inert or biologically inactive and it only acts as a precursor for the angiotensin 2. Now this angiotensin 1 or A1 is cleaved into angiotensin 2 or A2 by means of another enzyme called ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme which is primarily released by the lungs. Now this angiotensin 2 or A2 is an octapeptide because it contains 8 amino acid residues. This angiotensin 2 or A2 is a very potent vasoconstrictor substance and it has some other very important biological functions also. Or we may say that it is biologically active peptide in this system because it can bind to several different receptors in the body and thus has diverse functions. The word angiotensin is composed of two words. Angio means blood vessel and tensin from tension or constriction which describes the primary role of this substance as a potent vasoconstrictor agent. So if you could notice here this system is initially triggered by a versatile display of actions by three different organs kidney, the liver and the lungs. Coming back to the system, the resulting angiotensin 2 has several biological functions such as it stimulates the pituitary gland to release ADH or vasopressin. It also increases the aldosterone secretion from the adrenal cortex which is a mineralocorticoid this aldosterone is a steroid hormone which is released by the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex. Additionally, it also causes the systemic vasoconstriction by acting on the smooth muscles of the blood vessels. Angiotensin II is also known to trigger hypothalamus to stimulate thirst and thus increased water intake follows. The overall effect is increased blood volume and thus hypertension. So in this way, angiotensin 2 has several biological functions such as it stimulates the adrenal gland or the adrenal cortex of that to release aldosterone. It also stimulates the posterior pituitary to release ADH or antidiuretic hormone which is also called vasopressin. It's called vasopressin because it causes an increase in the blood pressure. We'll discuss the mechanism shortly and it also this angiotensin 2 also activates uh, a hypothalamus to increase the thirst and additionally it causes systemic vasoconstriction by constricting the smooth muscles of the blood vessels. Aldosterone, as I mentioned earlier, is a mineralocorticoid released by the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland and as you know that these glands sit above the kidneys and the main role of the aldosterone is to cause the reabsorption of sodium that is increase the sodium concentration in the blood and at the same time it also causes the excretion of potassium ions 
Thus, it may lead to hypokalemia. You also know that when the sodium is reabsorbed, it causes the water to be reabsorbed along with sodium. And this will then increase the blood volume and therefore the blood pressure also. On the other hand, ADH or vasopressin's main role is to conserve body water by reducing the water excretion in the kidney. So as a combined effect of aldosterone and ADH, the blood volume will increase even further and cause elevation in blood pressure. Now collectively increase systemic vasoconstriction by angiotensin 2, increase blood volume by the stimulation of thirst mechanism in the hypothalamus and the increased renal sodium and fluid retention by ADH and aldosterone, the blood pressure will increase and this is how obesity would result in hypertension. Now let me draw your attention to a very interesting point. Although the system is known as RAS or Renin angiotensin aldosterone system with two A's. One A is for angiotensin and the other one is for aldosterone. On a lighter side we could add one more A to it and that A would be for the ADH or antidiuretic hormone. So ROS with three A's. So renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, one extra A for ADH and S for system. So renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, ADH system. And it is all because ADH or antidiuretic hormone is a very important player in this system. Now let's see how insulin resistance plays its part in the pathogenesis of hypertension. Most of you would know that type 2 diabetes is usually caused by either the relative deficiency of insulin or the insulin resistance at the tissue site or the target sites. The research shows that insulin resistance is linked with hypertension and is mainly triggered by obesity. Insulin's primary role is to regulate the amount of sugar in your body. For example, in case of insulin resistance by obesity, your pancreas produces even more insulin in a confusion, mistaking the situation as if more insulin is required by the body to transport glucose across the cells. But since there is a state of insulin resistance in the body, so this insulin will start mounting in the blood along with blood sugar levels and this condition is known as hyperinsulinemia. Now there is a strong evidence that higher insulin levels in the blood or hyperinsulinemia is a hypertensive factor in the body and this is commonly seen in obese people. The studies show that hyperinsulinemia may cause the sodium retention in the body by increasing the reabsorption of sodium into the blood and thus raising the blood pressure. Now let's see how salt intake or sodium intake influences the blood pressure. In order to understand this, let me introduce you to a term called osmolality. Now osmolality refers to the concentration of a solute, for example sodium here, in a system, which is blood here. Now Higher osmolality means more solute or more sodium in the blood and lower osmolality means the blood is more diluted. Now we, we here discuss sodium only because it is one of the major electrolytes in the bloodstream. Others include magnesium and potassium. Eating salt could raise the blood osmolality which means it raises the amount of sodium in the bloodstream which also means that you are taking more sodium in the diet which is showing up in the blood and this will disturb the delicate balance between the sodium and water in the blood 
Now this high osmolality could result in high blood pressure because the natural ability of the kidney to get rid of sodium and water is disturbed now. You must have heard the phrase water follows sodium. And this could be explained on the basis of definition of osmosis which says it is the movement of water molecules movement of water molecules from a region of low solute or sodium concentration the low solute concentration or sodium concentration is in the interstitium to a region of higher solute or sodium concentration which is a condition in the blood so movement of water molecules from a region of low sodium concentration to a region of higher solute concentration or sodium concentration is osmosis now the water molecules will flow from interstitium into the blood so already we know that sodium concentration in the bloodstream is higher and in this way it will lead to the increased sodium and water retention in the blood vessel and will thus raise the blood volume and will also raise the blood pressure in this way low potassium and low calcium now low potassium can lead to hypokalemia a low dietary intake of potassium may increase the blood pressure while the potassium supplementation will lower the BP we normally say that civilized people with a high sodium and low potassium environment living a sedentary lifestyle and additionally having a genetic predisposition are the main victims of essential hypertension in short excess sodium is harmful while extra potassium is cardioprotective and renoprotective foods like bananas oranges cucumbers and potatoes are rich in potassium a good potassium balance is important in conditions like hypertension stroke and arrhythmias on the other hand several studies have revealed that low calcium intake is related to the high prevalence of cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension alcohol intake a drinking too much alcohol can raise the blood pressure to unhealthy levels increasing alcohol consumption has been linked to endothelial dysfunction and thus hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases the endothelial dysfunction is a condition in which the endothelial layer which is the inner layer here is the inner layer of the blood vessel and it fails to perform the critical functions now the endothelium maintains the proper dilation and constriction of the blood vessels and thus any damage to these endothelial cells will disturb the balance between the dilation and constriction and thus negatively impact the blood pressure vascular endothelial cells play a key role in cardiovascular regulation by releasing certain vasoactive compounds such as nitric oxide in endothelial dysfunction this vasodilator substance is reduced or less bioavailable which can greatly affect the health of blood vessels aging now, aging or cardiovascular aging can be a cause of essential or primary hypertension there are several key mechanisms which usually play a part in age related hypertension such as hormonal deficiencies metabolic syndrome or diabetes and endothelial dysfunction and the resulting arterial stiffening sedentary lifestyle now sedentary lifestyle or lack of physical activity is known to increase all the causes of cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension it also can lead to diabetes osteoporosis and depression i would say sedentary lifestyle in which you are mostly sitting or lying down engaged in activities like reading 
socializing on mobile phones, watching television, playing video games, and extended periods of use of computers may have seriously negative effects on your metabolism and could lead to cardiovascular and metabolic derangements. Let's throw some light on secondary hypertension and its pathogenesis. A secondary hypertension represents 10% cases of hypertension and it is basically a high blood pressure that is caused by another medical condition. For example, it could have renal causes like renal artery stenosis, which is an abnormal narrowing of the renal artery and that leads to hypertension glomerulonephritis, which is the inflammation of the kidney, diabetic nephropathy, which is a long-term complication of diabetes, and renin-producing tumors in the juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidney that can cause the elevation in blood pressure. It can be caused by some endocrine abnormalities, such as Cushing syndrome, which is an excessive cortisol release disease, Cohn syndrome, a syndrome which causes excessive aldosterone release, pheochromocytoma is a benign tumor and can cause excessive adrenaline release from the adrenal glands. Acromegaly is, ex is causing excessive growth hormone secretion. Hypothyroidism, which could lead to excessive thyroid hormone secretions. It could have some cerebral causes like raised intracranial pressure can lead to high blood pressure. There are several drugs which can cause high blood pressure, some of which are mentioned here, for example, adrenaline and all the related substances, including all the sympathomimetic drugs and oral contraceptive agents are well known for raising or elevating the blood pressure. Uh, elevated blood pressure requires timely treatment because otherwise it could lead to short-term and long-term effects or complications not only in heart but in many other organs such as cerebrovascular accidents which include heart attack or myocardial infarction and strokes or we also call them the cerebral attacks, hypertensive cardiomyopathy, hypertensive retinopathy which is damage to the retina, hypertensive nephropathy which is damage to the nephrons of the kidney and metabolic syndrome which is the diabetes. Pharmacotherapy or treatment of hypertension. Now the pharmacotherapy of hypertension can be approached in many ways using drugs with different mechanism of actions. Now these drugs can be divided into different classes which are summarized here. For example, diuretics including thiazides, loop and potassium sparing diuretics. Vasodilator agents such as alpha adrenoceptor antagonists which are also called alpha blockers. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACA inhibitors angiotensin-2 receptor blockers or ARBs, calcium channel blockers, direct acting arterial dilators, ganglion blockers, nitrodilators, potassium channel openers, renin inhibitors. There are some cardio inhibitory drugs which are very well known including beta blockers, calcium channel blockers and finally the centrally acting sympatholytics. Now we shall discuss the pharmacotherapy of hypertension later on in full length in another lecture. So that's it for now. See you later. Bye.